So Hosea 4.14 says, a people without understanding uh, come to ruin. Mm-hmm. We, the newest Supreme Court justice, she can't tell us what a woman is. This is true. Disney CEOs are getting in trouble for pedophilia. And a dude named Caitlyn Jenner is Fox News' most recent news correspondent hire. Oh, are you kidding? They hired They're hiring him? Caitlyn Jenner to come on as a conservative Fox News analyst or whatever. So my question is, what should the church be thinking and doing in light of this godless culture? Well, the first thing they have to do is teach the church the truth. And when I say that, that sounds obvious, right? Yeah. But I can assure you, because I got involved in the abortion issue many years ago, again, mid-80s, early 80s maybe, and one of the things I did is I would go to churches and talk to the pastor about having a pro-life group. At Mm -hmm. the time, it wasn't called Thrive, but it's now called Thrive St. Louis, come in and do presentations. And I had pastors look at me and literally say, well, I couldn't do that because our Sunday school teacher had an abortion and our director of this had an abortion, so... No, we can't do that. Wow. And so, in <clears throat> another case, I, I was at a pastor's lunch in a small group of guys. And I said, hey, guys, uh, I was sharing it. We took turns sharing it. I said, we need to really address the, the life issue, you know. Mm-hmm. And I had a guy literally say, out loud to the group, well, why? Because Christian women don't get abortions. Wow. Well, do you know that Planned Parenthood stats... The last stat I read was like 60% of the women coming in claimed to be Christians. Wow. And my wife worked at Thrive Clinic for 10 years and said that that's probably pretty close. Wow. So it's a problem in the church, okay? Are we just misunderstanding our our Bibles? Are Are our pastors not teaching things? Do we have, is it an antinomian problem? What is the systemic issue? Or is it all of the above? Is it, can, it's can it probably it, it probably it's probably all of the above, depending on the pastor and the you know what I'm saying. Um, look, I had people get up and walk out of my sermons before because I would have talk I would talk about political issues. Okay, so there's there's this aversion to talk about culture, which really ironically when you think about it, it's an aversion to talk about applying the Bible. Right. Okay. Um, which is ironic. <clears throat> but that's really where we're at. But I think in light of the, the, the growth movement I talked to you about earlier, which I think hit the church in the 80s, maybe even a little earlier than that, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It, it was fundamental to that vision that you do not offend anybody. Mm. You, wow. You don't offend people. Remember, you're building, the, you're making this thing bigger. And so it ceased to be genuine conversion as being to go being the goal mm-hmm. okay repentance and conversion being the goal to growth being the goal it became growth at any cost mm-hmm. which meant the word really got whittled down yeah um, now I got saved in a church that was it was would not talk about social political issues and it drove me crazy um, <clears throat> They preached the word. They preached a lot about the word. They preached about personal holiness. You know, they preached about, they talked about sin. But they didn't want to go into that. And part of the reason was the, the pastor and his wife had their own bad experiences in the past regarding those things, which I won't go into. But but the point is, is that in my own theological, spiritual development, I mean, I it just seemed, well, the question I kept on asking myself, okay, if I'm a Christian now, which I am, I'm a Christian now, how do I interface with the world that I live in? Mm-hmm. Okay. How do I, what do I think about taxes? What do I think about, you know, art? What do I think about economics? I mean, if you're going to teach any form of giving or tithing, you got to think about economics. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, why is it okay the government takes 40% of your check? Is that okay? Does God care? I mean... You don't have to think very hard about your Bible to realize the relevance of it all, yeah. you know, to every area of life. Now, evangelicalism today in America has been dominated by kind of a, a pre-mill, let, rapture me out of here, Jesus view. Oh, that's not accurate? <laughs> no. Um, but, the, but the point is, is that that, that worldview mm-hmm. begins to influence other things. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, so I, I would hear pastors say, well, what, you know, 
why uh, shine the brass on, on the Titanic when it's sinking, right? Right. <laughs> so the world's all going to hell. So we witness the people, keep your nose clean, and then Jesus will get out of here when things crash. And that's a real worldview. Now, they never put it that crassly, but that's really what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, but Schaefer raised the question, and that is, how shall we then live? Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to live in the world. Mm-hmm. How do you live in the world? And that means everything. The Christian life isn't just prayer and evangelism, or worship and evangelism, or Bible study and evangelism. The Christian life is every area of your life lived under Christ for his glory, mm-hmm. every area. So how do we do that? What does that look like to apply Christianity to every facet and area of life? You do what it says. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. You don't, you don't ignore scriptures like Ephesians 5, like you mentioned earlier, about yeah. husband and wife and submission. Yeah, you, and... Don't, you don't ignore scripture. Here's the thing. the As we were talking earlier over dinner, I'm, I think I made the statement that the 60s uh, were a tragedy, okay? And I have a book, a book by Russell Kirk um, about America, written in 1955, the year I was born. <laughs> and he was describing what Americanism is or was. And to read that book today, and when he wrote it, he wasn't saying we should be. He was saying, here's basically what Americanism is versus communism. Because that was the great threat, right? Mm -hmm. And he wasn't saying we should be this. He was basically describing the America of the day. If you read that book today, you'll fall out of your seat. Mm -hmm. Because we are a radically different, different nation. And it's because of the 60s. Um, Everything changed, unfortunately. So if you were born in, in 55 or you grew up in the 50s, you grew up in a culture that was friendly to Christianity... Mm-hmm. that supported intact, monogamous, heterosexual marriages, no easy divorce, okay? No premarital sex. I'm not saying people didn't do stuff. They did stuff. The point was the social uh, consensus was certain things were frowned upon. Now, certain things that are frowned upon, being white, <laughs> not really, being straight, being a Christian, being a virgin, this was frowned on. But back then, the things that were frowned on were the things the Bible frowns on. Because America was fundamentally a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. Um, It was the common law of the land. Um, People got in big trouble if they committed sodomy. Sodomy was illegal. Criminally legal everywhere in the U.S. until the 60s. Wow. Okay. You could go to prison. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, the, the the it's hard to think about now because you you're born into this chaos that we're in. Mm-hmm. But um, a real Christian culture is, is very possible. America had it for quite a while, but it's because they applied the scripture to every area of life. Mm-hmm. The key is appropriately p- applied because the government isn't supposed to do everything. Um, the family has major functions in culture, the church has major functions in culture, and then the state has its functions also. So it's just really a matter of, in my sense, in, in my understanding, is just walking out the biblical imperatives, but everywhere. Mm-hmm. Now, for us, for this generation, that means, here's the thing, back in the 50s or earlier, a lot of these things were just assumed, so people didn't think about them. Okay, but now we're in a world where all those Christian suppositions have been removed, and so it's like starting over. Mm-hmm. So now you've got Chris like, oh, well, what what do I think about government taking forty percent of my income? Now I'm using that as one simple example. Mm-hmm. How many Christians seriously have sat down and thought about the issue of taxation and what is just in the eyes of God for the civil government to do? Should the civil government be in charge of health care? Is that the government's role? Health care? Is that in the Bible? You, we could go through a whole list of questions and say, it, what does the Bible say? That, that's, really, that's really the way you need to start, we all need to start thinking. What does the Bible say about that? Whatever that is. I don't care whether it's marriage, 
um, taxation, anything, art. What does the Bible say about that? And it either speaks directly to it or it speaks by uh, necessary inferences, implications that can be drawn from the word. Uh, so the Bible addresses how to live now, here and now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't tell me how to play a harp in heaven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no verse like that. I'm serious. That's right. Yeah. yeah, we're going to heaven, but God created the earth for man. Yeah. Okay. He didn't create the earth for angels. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth right here. You might still live here, hmm. but everything would be glorified. Wow. And you might even take care of the lawn, but you won't <laughs> sweat because that was the fall. The fall will be gone. Yeah. So we may just spend some time in heaven. Maybe we'll go there for a vacation. Then we'll come back here. Maybe we'll interview on. you right here. Maybe. New heavens and new earth. <laughs> we might be on a different, you might go to a different planet. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. But the point is, you know, the, 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 uh, kind of the pre-millennial escapist view is that the earth is evil. Mm -hmm. Matter is evil. Every, things, things are evil. Politics is evil. Art's evil. Everything's evil. You know. Uh, we got to get out of here. It's such a bad place. Well, it is a bad place, but we're here. We're salt and light to make it a better place, right? Mm -hmm. um, when the Lord comes, it says that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So there'll be a complete purging of evil on the earth, in, really in the entire universe. So, you know, we need to walk out that vision and that promise, you know not just wait and put up with all the nonsense going on around us and just say, hurry, Lord, I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. So I've asked you this before, Romans <clears throat> 1, where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that we're under judgment. I mean, if we can't even define womanhood or right. a man is a man and we want to fairy tale and play yeah. pretend. Well, well here's my thoughts on that. Oh, uh, I, well, go ahead. I'll just wrap up the question. I know you're gone. So, yeah, you're, yeah. So, so uh -huh. we're, we're under judgment. We're, we're praying for reformation and revival. Mm -hmm. We're trying to live by the book, mm -hmm. by what the Word of God says. Okay. It, are we potentially too far in the West in this period of history right now with what we see at large, with the crazy nonsense, the way that it is? Or should we continually be praying? Well, should we, should we be praying the imprecatory prayers? Yes, go on. Or should we be just saying, hey, it really is, the West is probably over. We'll continue to do what we need to do in our household, but... It doesn't matter if the West is over. Okay. What does that got to do with the church? The church is called to be the church. Right. We're not called to be Western Christians. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I love... I'm a, I'm a patriot, okay? I love America because I've read enough and learned enough about the founders and... What a miracle! People do not appreciate the miraculous thing that happened with putting this country together and a constitution that's been balanced, has been, no, it's been, been balanced. Um, and the, the international, worldwide prosperity that has come out of America, okay? Um, look, we have millions of people at our southern border to get in, not out. Yep. yep. Okay. There's a reason for that. So it saddens me to see America decay. I mean, it can literally bring me to tears. It has before, actually. Mm -hmm. When I read the founders and I read them, yeah. I'm just like, I just think how far we have fallen. It's astounding, you know. Um, and God may, in his providence, let America fall. He let Rome fall. Mm -hmm. A lot of Christians did not want Rome to fall. Yeah. Okay, they they thought of Rome as the eternal city, yeah. um, but that doesn't mean all this. That does, if America falls, it doesn't mean anything regarding the church's mission. The mission's still the mission. Yeah, you're just doing it in a in a hostile, a different environment. I mean, America only has two futures. Did I say two? Mm -hmm. Maybe I meant three. <laughs> Amer I meant three. They can re America as a nation can repent and come back to God. In which case we'll get blessed and have more prosperity uh, and many other good things. Certain sins will be put down and um, righteousness will flourish. Or we will become communist or we will become Muslim. 
Those are the only three options. There is no other future. There's not going to be a Hindu America. There's not going to be a you know, Jehovah Witness America. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the, the, these are the three rival faiths. Okay, and Christianity, Islam, and communism. Communism is a bastard child of Christianity, actually. Okay, um, some people argue that Islam is too, or is a is a is a bastard of of especially the Old Testament, but really both. They both have a vision, an es- eschatological vision of victory. Yeah. Okay. And most Christians don't, <clears throat> right? I'm just going to say that the reason the church is being stomped is the church doesn't. Mm. We have an eschatology of defeat. Things are falling apart. Get me out of here, Jesus. Okay, that's not a vision of victory. So, what's our vision for the future? Is it things are going to get worse? Well, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy then, right? Things will get worse. If you don't believe things are can't change, they're not going to change. I mean, God doesn't... We need to understand that God works through secondary means, okay? God's means for doing his work on the earth is his people. Now he can work outside his people. I believe God, God has you know saved people without anybody preaching at certain individuals. Mm-hmm. I know too many stories, you know. Yeah. Um, but the point is, he generally operates a certain way through his people. Well, his people believe part of their calling is to do nothing regarding culture that gets what happens to the culture, right? That's all, the whole point of the salt is to stop the corruption. Well, if the salt pulls back, if the salt isn't applied to that area of life, that area will get corrupt. It's the, it's the law of its nature. It's fallen nature to be corrupt, right? So, really, 1920s is is probably when the church really started to pull back. Liberalism? Is, well, there was, all, there was always liberalism. I'm just saying the conservative church pulled back from the culture. Right. And and withdrew. Um, not all Christians, and not all denominations, and not all at once, but the Scopes trial was, I think, a turning mm-hmm. point because Christianity began to be mocked publicly, and I think the church... Felt defeat, you know, public defeat in the public eye, got a black eye, if you will, and um, it was the beginning of a, of a withdrawal, if you will, from culture, cultural mm-hmm. endeavors. Mm-hmm. So, um, and now we get the the morass we're in, where you don't know what a woman is. Yeah. So the church should be infiltrating the culture. Well, unless you want to live in a hut somewhere. I mean, to me, it isn't <laughs> should you. It's like. Live your life according to Christ's commands. Mm-hmm. Live according to the word. Okay? And, you know, if, if, if the world around you is contrary to that word, at least in America still, you, you have the right to say, I think we should do things this way. Mm-hmm. This is the way we should go. Um, so, you know, the, the founders of America were self-consciously Christian. Okay? So they thought through the issues in light of scripture, in light of philosophy, political theory, all kinds of things. But they were self-conscious of what they were doing. So, you know, it's like Christians have this this feeling like, well, they don't have a right to speak or they don't have a right to shape things according to their values. Well, you leave that vacuum and the culture will look how it got shaped. Mm-hmm. You know, we're mutilating children so they can be a different gender because we don't even know what gender is anymore. Well, it's crazy. Yeah. But that's Romans 1. Yeah. That's a judgment. The thing about you mentioned judgment in Romans 1 is that, well, let's talk about the trans thing in a minute. Okay. Just for a minute because okay. you you brought it up. Any sane person has said, has said to himself, do these people really believe this? Right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Does she really believe? She really doesn't know what a woman is, and she's a woman, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think that a lot of people, the vast majority of people know. Even people on the left, they know what a woman is. They know what a man is. Mm -hmm. I think um, the only people that are confused are actually the trans people themselves. They are confused, okay? Any person that would want to have their genitals cut off to be a different, that's a troubled person. 
okay? And they're troubled emotionally, psychologically. They're confused. They might really believe they're a different, they're a different sex, if you will, a different gender. Um, most of the people around them know better. But our culture refuses to offend yeah. anybody's sensibilities, unless you're a Christian. Unless you're a Christian. White yeah. Christian. Yep. Um, and so everybody gets placated in their delusions. Okay. Now, I've seen it even in church. People come to me for counseling. They say, oh, this is the situation. This is. And I obviously know they're lying, but they're lying to themselves. I know they're wrong. And in, in, in their own ways, they would... They wouldn't. They would plead with me in their own ways, but what they really they were they were pleading with me to enter their delusion, mm -hmm. and agree with them. Yeah, and I wouldn't do it because it's not true. And so, um, and people got mad at me because of that, because I wouldn't enter their delusion. Well, that's what's happening in our culture. You've got a lot of delusion going on with individuals and, and groups, and people are entering their delusions, if you will. Although. I think what they're really doing is they're just placating because that's now the, the, the socially mandated way to act. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can reassure you that there are all kinds of people who in public will nod the trans thing who think it's a joke in private. Mm -hmm. They don't believe it. But they're not going to speak out because they're afraid. So what should Christians do? Say we work with, say there's people we work with because there, there are. I mean, it's becoming so typical. Do we say we work with Bob and Bob's become Jane, whatever? Uh, do do we as Christians acknowledge? Is it okay to acknowledge the name change? So they change their name, pronoun but, thing, but, but, but not their. <laughs> not, I'm not going to actually address Bob as if he really is a female now. Mm -hmm. How should how should a believer? Um, approach this. If Caitlin wants to be called Caitlin, that's fine. I don't care. Caitlin can call himself whatever he wants to. Mm -hmm. But I won't refer to him as a woman. Right. Because that's a lie. Yeah. You know, you can't just lie because the people you're talking to want you to lie. Right? Right. So, if I came to this interview and said, by the way, I'm a black female, would you say, okay, <laughs> Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Vaughn? Yeah. <laughs> would you say that? Absolutely. You'd be lying. No. Right. You'd be lying, even yeah. if I even if I believed it, right? And so there, you know, gender dysphoria is a real mental illness. That's really what we're talking about here, right? And it's become a political movement. It's been political politicized, I believe, for political reasons. And the vast majority of people who are not under God's ultimate judgment yet can see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, even natural law tells us these things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, do you want to call Bob Mary? Because he goes by Mary Fine. But if you say, refer to Mary as her, then you're lying. No. Yeah. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. You might lose your job, but I wouldn't do it. And the, the, can I say one more thing? Mm -hmm. the, the church, the, the church... Even if the church got a vision for cultural transformation, which is another way of saying revival and its effects. Revival doesn't stay in the church walls. Mm -hmm. Revival means that the move of God overflows out of the church into the culture. That's what the Reformation was. Transformed Europe, transformed the world mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. It flows out of the church, through the church and out the doors. And if there's a revival in the church and sort of flowing out, what Christians need to understand is is they must be willing to pay a price. And I'll just say this straight up. Most Christians are cowards. They will not offend. They'll hide the gospel. Uh, they'll subtly deny Jesus because they just won't speak. Their silence is denial. They don't want to be mocked. They don't want to lose their job. They don't want any cost. They want to be a disciple of Jesus. And they want to say they're carrying their cross because, you know, they're dealing with some grumpy husband or something. But that's not the, that's not what Jesus was talking about. He says, they will hate you because they hated me. They hated him without a cause. They'll hate you without a cause. But they'll find a cause 
because the darkness hates the light. Um, I've experienced this many times. The perfect example is when I when I when I go to get a haircut, the gal's chatting away, chat 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 chat. What do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Did I change? <laughs> no. What happened? You're a pastor. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. Okay. So people see the light in you. Assume you're shining your light. They're going to they're be drawn to Christ through it, or they're going to hate you. No. Meaning they pull back. They don't like you know. There's only two kinds of people. Right. Yep. Jesus says in John 3, right after that lovely verse about God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him would not perish. Right after that, he says, but men loved darkness more than light. So until the church is ready to, to suffer the consequences of standing against the current culture, the culture will never change. Fundamentally, discipleship requires living out the word in every area of your life. But Jesus' symbol of discipleship was cross-bearing. And until we're willing to do that, and cross the cross means shame or suffering or both. Okay, Until we're willing to do that, pay that price, we won't be the salt and the light. Okay, We cannot live in fear. He told us, I'm sending you out as wolves. You know, sheep to the wolves. Do not fear, he said repeatedly in Matthew 10. Do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. Some of us have to die. Some Until we're ready to lose our jobs, until we're ready to go to prison, we're not ready to change culture. I feel that strongly about it. Wow. It doesn't matter how big our churches are. Yeah. If we're not walking out the church doors and speaking the truth. Yeah. So... You had a question about the 60s. I did, yeah. So you said that everything went wrong in the 60s. What were some of those specific things that changed everything? And is a lot of the corruption and the immorality that we see today, is are we seeing the grown child of what was sown then? Well, let me say this about that. Uh, intellectual history is interesting because the more you read, the more you realize that it's like it's, it's like an onion, really. You pull a layer off, there's another, I got another layer, another layer, another layer. So to say it began in the 60s is, is true in one sense, and I'll explain that in a minute, but in another sense it began earlier because um, these movements don't just appear, they grow, they simmer. They, you know, you can go from the 60s to Marx, probably Marx and Freud, but then you can go from Marx and Freud back to Rousseau. And so you can trace these concepts that, you know, gain momentum over time, right? The thing about the 60s is that a lot of uh, ideas, philosophical ideas, left the academy, if you will, and hit the culture. You know, I don't care if philosophers sit and talk about trannies all day long. I don't think they talk about what they want. But once they say, oh, you now have to call this man a woman. Well, now people are waking up to, hey, this this is getting bad, right? <laughs> well, it was bad earlier in the, in the academy. It was bad what people were saying. It had been saying for hundreds of years, actually. But now it's this is just like earlier you said, use the word applied. Applied Christianity. Well, they've got applied philosophy. They've got a, applied Marxism, if you will. The, you know, it's hard to speak of these things because it, it'll sound simplistic to somebody that's very well read because I'm trying to give a simple answer because mm -hmm. there are a lot of threads that feed these things. The philosophical thread, the, the there's also change to technological changes that have occurred a lot of things converged in the 60s okay but the 60s was basically marxism marxism by another name okay um and what we see today is just an express is an expression of things that were espoused back in the 60s it's just that it took this long to break down the resistance of the institutions and the culture to the things that were being proposed. 
uh, there's a good book that uh, I'm giving you a copy uh, later. Good. Called Social Justice and the Church, written back in the early 80s. And then you look for the bibliography, there's books written in the 17th and 60s by Christians and liberal Christians. This is not a new thing. Social justice is not a new thing. Um, this has been going on for a long time. But it takes years for these things to seep down then into the culture, okay? And so uh, Roger Kimball wrote a book called The Long March. This is where Marxist thinkers took over the institutions, mainly the academy, okay? If you control the schools, you control the brains, you control the culture. Um, it just so it took them a really, I guess, two generations, if you will, to this point. If you started in 1960, um, what was your question? <laughs> what oh, is it yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so my point 60s. is, if you go back and read writers in the 60s, even writers in the 40s and 30s, <clears throat> their ideas you'll see everything happening that they talked about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Marx was very upfront about one thing. We have to destroy the family. This is the greatest resistance to the, the goals of uh, Marxism was private property in the family. He said it. Yeah. Um, and so it's taken from, you know, was that 18... 48, 60, I forget what year it was. It's, it's taken that long. But from there to the 60s, it was about 100 years. And then from the, where a lot of these ideas then now are being uh, attempted to be lived out, if you will. Mm -hmm. The communes and the free love and all this you know, stuff. Um, and so this is an evolution of, of the same kind of thing. It's, it's an attempt to destroy the created order. Mm -hmm. and create a new order, a man-made order. The created order is man, woman, family, right? Uh, they get together and they have babies. So what's being attacked? Babies are being killed, right? The family is, being, is, is under siege. The very notion of human identity is now the target because the, the communist goal, the Marxist goal, is for the elite to reshape humanity, literally, literally reshape in the image of man, mm -hmm. people. And so you have to break down the resistance to that. And so that's what we're seeing now. And we're seeing, I mean, it's insane, but you have people and trying to teach kindergartners now that you can be a boy or a girl, neither or both. Yeah. What, do you want to, what do you want to choose? They're saying this in the, in the government schools. Yeah. Uh, you don't think we're going to have problems in 20 years from now? Um, so it's been a long march. Mm -hmm. But I would recommend Kimball's book, The Long March. I would recommend Oskinis' book, The Dust of Death. Mm. To, to read both of those to learn about the 60s. Now, there are other books, but those two are like foundational. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Sorry. Oh, but, okay. Does um, it pertain to this? Yes. Okay, good. Kind of. Right. So you said what could change our culture now is Christians being courageous. Christians mm -hmm. standing up, being willing, whatever it costs them. Um, what are good habits or practices for Christians to um, take on, be disciplined in, to, ha to grow that kind of courage, to be those kinds of... Well, look, the fundamentals are prayer, word, and worship, right? You, you need to be in the Word. You need to pray. You need to be part of a Christian community. Um, again, preaching in the Word. That's pretty simple. Well, you need to witness too. But a lot of Christians don't even do that anymore because they're afraid. Okay? <clears throat> so I think you should live out prayer, Word, evangelism, giving. Foundational. Basic. Mm -hmm. And then Christians need to say, I'm tired of the way things are. I'm going to change it. So I'm going to run for the school board. I'm going to run for the board of aldermen. I'm going to, you know, those are only, that's one's education. You know what? I'm going, I'm going to volunteer in my library and find out what's really in those books. I'm going to do something. Not just go to church and receive. I'm going to do something. 
act. So the, the practices are important, but if you don't apply it, it's irrelevant. You know, we have to act. So I think every Christian should be praying, God, what are you calling me to do? Yeah. Not just in the church, but to do in the culture. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned communism, Karl Marx. The World Economic Forum is led by a guy named Klaus Schwab, mm -hmm. who says by 2030, you'll own nothing and be happy. Mm -hmm. I posed this question to Doug Wilson in our interview with him. And I said, okay, by 2030, Klaus Schwab says, you'll own nothing and be happy. Mm -hmm. By 2030, David Vaughn says, is that Well, I'll be in possible? heaven, so you guys can do what you want. <laughs> you, know, <by laughs> you don't know that. No man knows. <laughs> <laughs> no man knows. So what are you asking me? Is that going to happen? So I'm asking you, do you, th do you think those threats that literally all of the world won't have private property that's by the, 2030? Well, that's the goal. That's the goal. But do you think, I mean, is that, is that, pro is that possible? I think it's possible. You think it's possible? And the reason I think it's possible is because of digital currency. The technology that's available now is the thing that threatens our liberties more than anything. You know, Hitler could have said that. I'm going to do this and this, and mm -hmm. he had no way to do it. Yeah, but they but now did. you are tracked all the time through your phone. Yeah. yeah. So every purchase you make with a debit card is tracked. Um. So your freedom is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Mm -hmm. Now, say you want to get off the grid and use cash. Fine, until they take cash away. Once our currency becomes totally digital. You, you're at the point where we're talking the mark of the beast stuff that you will not be able to buy or sell if they choose that you're one of the marginalized. Okay. So my point is, whether you think that's literal or not, that if, I mean, Biden has proposed, do you, you realize that he's proposed that any transaction via your bank yep. of $600 yep. be reported to the IRS. Yep. Six hundred dollars or more—it's insane. Yeah. Um, but even now, let's say you have fifty grand in the bank. If you want to pull out ten grand, the IRS, uh, the FBI, and all those people know. Okay, because that's a—you can't. That's a big. I think that's the limit where they start watching to see if what's going on. It's going to be argued that digital currency is going to solve crime. Mm. It'll, yep. get, it'll, it'll get rid of money laundering. Yep. That sort of thing. Um, but once that happens, then do you really own your money? Right. No, seriously. If the government can just hit a button, we saw it in Canada already yep. with the truckers convoy. When pe people that gave 20 bucks to the truckers had their bank accounts frozen. Well, are you, if your bank account's frozen, it doesn't matter if you have a million bucks there, you can't buy anything yeah you can't eat okay so uh that's their goal they've said it out loud and most people aren't paying attention yeah and but, you think it's possible sure i do and you, i think, you think it's likely that they'll that they'll succeed well evil never succeeds ultimately that's the thing to remember mm -hmm. okay george grant said to me one time he said the reason i don't believe in conspiracy theories is because people can't get along <laughs> right. You know, the the people that the, the the cabal that wants to run the world, they're going to fight amongst each other, you know. Yeah. Um, but I'm actually more frightened by uh, woke capitalism, big tech, mm -hmm. than I am by the government. Yeah. Because the government is fight the right and left do fight. Now some of it's just show, but there's a real c healthy conflict there. Big tech's the scary thing. Um. I mean, true. Think about living off the grid. What would that be like? It's for real, you know. I mean, that kind of persecution may be God's way. Okay. The thing we need to remember: you can be post mill, and you can say victory's ours in the end. But victory in a war doesn't mean victory in every battle. Mm -hmm. A lot of people die in a war that you win. Yeah. And so right now, we've got Christians persecuted in China, put in prison. They're being killed. Middle East are being killed. They're being killed in Africa daily. Okay. Well, there are brothers and sisters going to the same kingdom that we are. But that's what God has chosen for them. Okay. So yeah. 
we need to realize that you know we want victory sitting on the couch. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, and believe in it doesn't just make it so. You know, so um, the church has given up so much ground. You wonder, can it get it back? Well, you know, God can do anything. Mm -hmm. The Reformation was a real thing, but he did it through people. He did it through people who were willing to stand. Luther was ready to die. He would have died for his convictions. Calvin would have died. Zwingli did die. He died on the battlefield. I mean, these guys were serious. And so until we're that earnest in our faith, um, things will just go along. Yeah. And, you know, we'll probably even get to go to church. It's just that once you walk out, you can't say anything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, just so they control everything. I mean, there's Christian churches in China that are state churches. Yeah. It's nuts. Yeah, it is nuts. It's nuts. So to me, the disciplines are important, but the bottom line is until you're willing to walk it out, and that takes courage, and God can give any Christian that courage, but you don't get it until you do it. Okay? Yeah. You don't get, you know, I prayed to the Lord, you know, like, Lord, I prayed this years ago. If I ever have to be martyred, give me martyr's grace. Because I don't think I got it, you know. Yeah. Um, but you don't know until you're in the moment. In, in that moment, when the fire's lit, you'll get the martyr's grace. Not now. So you have to walk into the fire. You have to walk into the fight. Walk into the battle. And God will give you what you need in that moment. Yeah. You know. Courage isn't not having fear. Courage is, is overcoming your fear by action. So I think this is what we need. If, yeah. every, if every true Christian... Now, there's a lot of non nominal Christians or Christian name only, but there are a lot of believers in, in this country. If every Christian said, I'm taking my kids out of the public school tomorrow, every Christian, the system would collapse. Yeah. Okay. 85% of evangelicals have their kids in government schools. That's how compromised the church is. So we need to pull our kids out. And that means, guess what? You're not going to get a new car ever again in your life. <laughs> yep. You're not, going to take, you're not going to take a vacation every year either. You're not going to get this and this and this and this. Your house is going to look like crap in 20 years because you're living <laughs> on one income so you can raise your kids at home and spare them the atrocity of the government school. If we're not, if we're not willing to make really what are, my wife and I did it on a pastor's salary. Mm -hmm. Okay, God provides when you obey Him. If, but if we're not willing to make sacrifices, we're not going to change anything. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, you know, yeah. nobody who's ever affected history uh, chose an easy path. Never. Yeah. So, it's a good note to end on. Do you have any further questions? Oh, she's so got a whole bunch. I'll come back another time. We'll do a, <laughs> we'll, do we'll do another, another one. one. We'll and do a multi-series. We'll do a multi-series, and then maybe we'll can drag my wife into that one and talk. Let's definitely do that. Talk about marriage stuff then. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks. Yes, thank, thank you. you love you guys. Yeah, love you. Thank you for listening to the Love of Life podcast, Conversations with Jesse and Courtney. It is our duty through our schools to create a new one, a God-centered one. We are told in Proverbs 8, verses 35 and 36, For whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death.